programming of our church stayed the same. The staff stayed the same. I mean, we literally changed nothing except saying, we're going to stake ourselves to corporate prayer and the preaching and teaching of the Word. And it's like the Spirit just showed up. Well, welcome to the One Cry podcast. I'm Bill Eloff. I'm on the executive team with One Cry Initiative, and my co-host is Kyle Reno, and we're so thrilled to welcome you today. The whole point of the One Cry podcast is to help accelerate in any way that we can the movement of God in revival and spiritual awakening. Yeah, and we hope that these last episodes have been helpful. And if you haven't yet, you can go back and listen to those episodes, sort of get caught up on where we're heading, the progression of these things. But I'd really want to encourage you to share it with somebody. Mm-hmm. Like we, Our hope is that this resource would help fan into flame what God has done and desires to do even now. Well, and the whole point of One Cry, think of the name of that, yeah. is to help generate a united cry mm-hmm. because that always precedes spiritual awakening, as we're going to see today. Uh, I have, by the way, eight children, <laughs> count them. They're all married. I have uh, 22 uh, and grandchildren. Growing, and growing. It makes me tired just <laughs> saying that. Yeah. And when I was uh, younger and they were younger, you know, one kid could come jump on me and say, Dad, we want ice cream. I could kind of blow that off pretty easily. But when all eight of them <laughs> come and yeah, say, they ice win. cream, ice cream, we yes. all want ice cream. I'm a I'm a goner. Yeah, and, right. uh, and you got five. I kids. got five kids. Yeah, and don't let them know they can do that. Yeah, that's <laughs> right. right. But but there is an incredible power mm. with God, an almost irresistible power, that's I awesome. would say, uh, in a united cry. Yeah, and I know that you've thought a lot about this, Bill, and even that illustration, obviously, of, of eight kids crying at once. But to really see in Scripture and see across redemptive history. What happens when people come together and cry out for God to do only God kind of stuff in their day where they are? So maybe you can spend some time and talk to us a little more about that. You know, there's a, a, a true story, uh, and we write about it in, in a book that Byron Paulus and I wrote entitled One Cry uh, about a bridge in Angers, France. And it was, it was built in 1839, and it had served going across the main river, served well for 11 years. Uh, but then one day, 486 French soldiers were walking across that bridge in cadence. Mm-hmm. And as they walked across, the, the wind and the sound waves uh, literally collapsed that bridge, and 226 men went to their death. Mm-hmm. Uh, because of that, uh, our military and most of the militaries around the world, when they go across a bridge, won't go in cadence because there is an, just an unbelievable power in unity. You think about this from the very beginning of, of God's created time and the building of the Tower of Babel. And as they united to build this tower to replace God, God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit said to each other, you know, nothing will be impossible to them now. So there's something about unity that is unbelievably powerful. A.T. Pearson, who was George Mueller's uh, son-in-law, said there's never been a spiritual awakening in any nation or locality that hasn't begun with united prayer. And uh, when you just study revival and study spiritual awakening, you, you see, as Matthew Henry, uh, the Puritan said, when God intends great mercy on his people, he always starts them a-praying. Hmm. We turn from ourself, and we turn to him. And when we think about this last year, and COVID, and the race riots, and all that's happened, if this year doesn't turn us to him, What will do that? We desperately need God. And the beauty is people are seeing that more and more and more. And the result is we are seeing more united prayer, and rightfully so, than we ever have. There's a irresistible power to God in a united cry. And as we said earlier in one of our podcasts, there's a cycle of revival 
It begins with the church walking in power, and they fall away. God sends his discipline, and then you hear this little phrase, when we get desperate enough, and all the people cried out. And I want to do something a little unusual today on the broadcast. I just want to take a moment and read some scripture to you that illustrate this. These scriptures can be found in this uh, One Cry book, which can be found on our website. But where you're listening right now, you I almost would invite you to just close your eyes and just listen to the common theme in this long list of scriptures. Are you ready? Here we go. It came about in the course of those many days that the king of Egypt died, and the sons of Israel sighed because of the bondage, and they cried out. And their cry for help because of their bondage rose up to God, and he heard their groaning and remembered his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Here's another scripture. The people became like those who complain of adversity in the hearing of the Lord. And when the Lord heard it, his anger was kindled. The fire of the Lord burned against them. And then the people cried out, and God heard their prayer. When we cried out to the Lord, he heard our voice and sent an angel and brought us out of Egypt. I brought your fathers out of Egypt, and you came to the sea. And Egypt pursued your fathers with chariots and horsemen to the Red Sea. But when they cried out to the Lord... He put darkness between you and the Egyptians and brought the sea upon them and covered them. And your own eyes saw what I did to Egypt. Here's another passage. They, the people lamented after the Lord. And when they cried out, God heard and answered their prayer. Another one. When Jacob went into Egypt and your fathers cried out to the Lord, the Lord sent Moses and Aaron who brought your fathers out of Egypt and settled them in this place. And then they turned again away from the Lord and said, they cried out to the Lord and said, we have sinned because we've forsaken the Lord. And the Lord sent Jerubbabel and others and delivered you from the hands of your enemies. In your, you, our fathers trusted, the psalmist said, they trusted and you delivered them to you. They cried out and were delivered. They cried out to the Lord in their trouble. He delivered them out of their distress. Here's another scripture. The Lord has done what he purposed. He has accomplished his word, which he commanded from days of old. He has thrown down without sparing. He's caused the enemy to rejoice over you. He has exalted the might of your adversaries. Their heart cried out to the Lord. O wall of the daughter of Zion, let your tears run down like a river day and night. Give yourself no relief. Let your eyes have no rest. Arise, cry aloud in the night at the beginning of the night watches. Pour out your heart like water before the presence of the Lord. Lift up your hands to him for the life of your little ones who are faint because of the hunger at the head of every street. And in this passage in Joel, consecrate a fast, proclaim a solemn assembly, Gather the elders and all the inhabitants of the land to the house of the Lord your God and cry out to the Lord. Alas for the day, for the day of the Lord is near and it will come as destruction from the Almighty. Do you hear that theme? It is constant through the scripture. When we get in distress, here's the prescription, cry out. Mm. And when all the people unite in a cry to the Lord, he is glad he rejoices in the opportunity to redeem and deliver and manifest himself. But what he needs from us is such desperation and hunger for him that we will unite in one cry for revival and spiritual awakening. I mean, that's so powerful to hear, Bill, all those passages of Scripture pointing us the same direction. And that's not something that God just did. That's something God's doing. Even now, we got a pastor that we're going to hear from, Nathan Lino, that really seen this, like playing out in his context. So let's take a few minutes and really listen to his story. Wow, thanks, Kyle and Bill, for letting another report of God's working right now uh, to come forth to our listeners and uh, thank you for these segments and, and these podcasts. And a few weeks ago, uh, I was with Nate Lino here in Northeast Houston, Humble, Texas. Humble, Texas, I think they yeah, pronounce right. it right. I uh, don't know why they ever threw an H in there, but nevertheless, they did. And 
I, I was just very moved in that segment as Nate began to share kind of what preceded the precursor uh, to the presence of God. It's just showing up, showing himself real here in this place. And so I want to pick up today, uh, Bill, especially here, uh, from those moments to what is happening now by way of corporate prayer among the congregation. And uh, Nate, you shared, um, even in the service this morning, I think it was, and with me personally, uh, the fear of man first, that you were desperate, that you're afraid nobody's going to respond, but you didn't know what else to do, really. That's right. uh, but God didn't do it. It wouldn't get done. And then um, uh, you begin to share a little bit about how just God began to move on hearts. They started praying. God began to show up. So some of the fruit and anything else here, just in closing on this segment then before we go in a few moments here, anything else you want to look in the camera, look in the eyes of other pastors mm -hmm. and say, Pastor, don't let this moment pass by. Yeah. You have that same opportunity. You, you can see the same thing happen in your church. So Nate, yeah, talk to the hearts of these pastors. Yeah, I appreciate that. Well, as our church was gathering to pray, one of the lessons the Lord really taught us in our hearts was the necessity of depending on corporate prayer as much as we were depending on the proclamation of the word in the life of our church. Not to diminish the word in any way. We want to maintain a high view of scripture, but to elevate corporate prayer and its critical nature in the life of the church to the same level of public proclamation of the word. And so we began doing that and immediately began to notice a heightened supernatural presence of God in our church. So some of the fruit that we began to experience right out the gate in those first few prayer meetings, we started seeing people voluntarily repent of secret sin. We weren't even emphasizing repentance of secret sin necessarily, uh, but we had, for example, over 10 couples in which a spouse looked at their spouse and confessed adultery from years prior, sometimes over a decade mm, prior. Sure. I mean, they'd buried right. it, they'd gotten sure. away with it, so to speak, and these but these spouses were not confessing adultery in a, in a pastor's office or in a counseling appointment. They were doing it in the worship center, in prayer meeting with people mm, sitting around them. They were so yeah. wow. compelled by the spirit to do something about their buried mm. sin. Mm. So we started seeing repentance. We started seeing uh, uh, physical miracles. Um, houses that weren't selling started selling. People who couldn't get jobs started getting jobs. We saw uh, over 10 uh, medically verified physical healings from diseases uh, over that September to December time span. Uh, people would show up on Tuesday night and get in the one-on-one -on -one prayer line and pray for the heart of an adult child that had turned to stone to be turned back to flesh. And within 24, 48 uh, hours, uh, that child, had, their, their heart had turned back to flesh. Mm -hmm. We started seeing elevated numbers of salvations and baptisms mm -hmm. from September to December. We saw 174 people saved, mm -hmm. bunches of baptisms. Mm -hmm. This spring, mm -hmm. since January 1st, we've yeah. seen another 195 people saved, lots mm -hmm. of baptisms. So mm -hmm. we're looking at around 400 salvations mm -hmm. since this all started on September 1st. We've seen mm -hmm. elevated numbers of men surrendering to become senior pastors. I mean, mm -hmm. And, and the thing, Byron, is we yeah. didn't change anything in our church yeah. except to elevate corporate prayer to the level of public proclamation of the word. The programming of our church stayed the same. The staff stayed the same. Yeah. I mean, we literally changed nothing except saying we're going to stake ourselves to corporate prayer and the preaching and teaching of the word. And it's like the spirit just showed up. Yeah, and on the elevation of the word, we talked earlier, Martin Lloyd-Jones is one of your heroes, I yes. guess, in the faith. Yes, And um, uh, after he passed away, uh, somebody asked his wife, his widow, uh, do you miss your husband's preaching? And she replied, not nearly as much as his praying because his pastoral prayer on Sunday mornings was 25 minutes elevating <laughs> prayer in the midst of the proclamation right. of the word. Tell them a lot that, of sermons are right now. Yeah, right. And then Bill McLeod, in, in whose church the Canadian revival was birthed in the 70s, Duncan Campbell came through and he challenged Bill, uh, the evangelist Duncan Campbell from Ireland or Scotland, and he, and he challenged Bill. He said, look, when you have as many people coming to your week uh, day prayer meeting as you do your Sunday morning worship service, God will move in your wow. church. 
Wow. So he began to put elevating as much effort and energy That's and preparation right. into their midweek prayer meeting as he did the Sunday, and that day came. And when he did, that ignited the revival that Henry Blackaby talks about wow. and so many others. So I love the way you said that. Elevating, not diminishing proclamation, but elevating the prayer component. That's right. That's right. So talk to these pastors. What would you say to them uh, uh, that are sitting back and say, yeah, that worked for Robbie Gallaty that we were talking to a couple of weeks ago, you know, and it works for Nate uh, Leno down here in Houston, but... Not my church. I mean, maybe it's somebody else's church, but not my church. We aren't big enough. We aren't spiritual enough. I'm not bold enough. Just again, how can they elevate that? I, and I, I would assume it began personally first. Yeah, that's in right. their own heart. And you shared last time how you got desperate and had nothing to do but turn to God. That's right. So yeah. So in closing here for this two segment, thank you so much. Yeah. Anything else in your heart that you'd like to share with the pastors? I mean, just a brief word of encouragement. Um, when I look back on my seminary days, I can remember hours and hours of instruction about interpreting scripture and mm. teaching scripture and skills for that. I struggle to remember any professor even talking about prayer meeting. Never mind the fact no one taught me how to lead a corporate body into the presence of God mm. and how to sit in it. So I would just say to pastors sitting out there, I know that probably one of your primary fears and struggles with all of this is how do I lead a corporate body into the presence of God and to sit there and stay there? I know how to lead myself into the presence of God and stay there, but what about a whole body of believers? Mm. They didn't teach me either. <laughs> it's not just you. Uh, all I know is when I realized that scripture says, Nathan, you should devote as much time to uh, planning and leading corporate prayer meetings as you do preparing and preaching sermons, i.e. Acts 6-4, because now the time has come when my people will worship me in spirit and in truth. Okay? When, I, when, when, when I made that decision in my heart, the Holy Spirit took over and led me to people like Jim Cimbala and others who were able to teach me and give me the skills about how to lead people. And so I, I would say, Pastor, trust the Spirit he wants your church to be a house of prayer more than you do. Yeah. If you will just lock it into your heart that you will marry yourself to your church becoming a house mm. of prayer and mm. stake yourself and your church mm. to that, the Spirit will guide your steps mm. to the people and resources He wants you to encounter so that He can equip you how to lead your people into the presence of God and sit there. Well, wow, that's so helpful and it's very practical. And somebody told me, actually it was Leonard Ravenhill. I was blessed to be around him in some of his final years. And he said, Byron, remember this, you learn to pray by listening to godly people pray. That's right. Just be in the midst of those prayers of pastors and, that's right. and, and intercessors who cry out to God. And that's how you learn to pray. And so uh, resource, I know at the end of these One Cry podcasts, we're always going to have just a season of prayer. And, and Bill and Kyle, thank you for leading those. And uh, also on Tuesday evenings, 8 o'clock, uh, One Cry, Prayers for the Nation. It's not just a few people that are praying, but every week we have seven or eight different people around the country who really get a hold of God. And they join as intercessors. Just tune in, not for the sake of necessarily just filling another hour in a prayer meeting, but to learn how to pray and to cry out to God together in these days. Nate, thank you so much. What a blessing. And Bill and Kyle, man, thank you for what you're doing. And uh, God bless everyone. Well, it's just so <laughs> exciting to hear what God is doing there in Houston. And really, and we've heard from Robbie Gallaty mm -hmm. in Tennessee. Right. And, and we could tell stories right. of more and more churches that are seeing the need to gather for united prayer. Mm. And not only that, but we're hearing uh, and seeing huge movements of prayer across our nation. And this, this is the kind of activity that yeah. always precedes a great awakening. Mm. One of the things we're praying for at One Cry is that God would raise up 5,000 congregations that would restore corporate prayer yeah. every week into the rhythm of their life. Yeah, we're in a moment. You can feel right. it. Like we're right. in a moment where we're catching uh, the wind of what God's wanting to do. 
And we don't need to miss it, man. We mm-hmm. need to lean, identify with other churches saying, oh, we're praying, you're praying, let's mm-hmm. get together and pray and find out how to do that to unite that cry more effectively. And, you know, uh, this could be as simple, uh, Kyle, as our church praying and then inviting uh, a couple of other churches. you got a pastor friend, another right. friend. Say, hey, let's just get together mm-hmm. once a month and just pray. If you mm-hmm. can't organize a whole city to pray... Mm-hmm. Invite a couple of friends yeah. who would come and bring some of their people yeah. from their church and just pray. And it doesn't have to be a production. Mm-hmm. It's just a prayer meeting. Yeah. We're in humility. We're crying out to the Lord. Yeah. Uh, so we want to do that even right now. Right. And uh, we we know you're listening to this podcast and you're right here with us. And you're probably listening because you sense the same burden mm-hmm. to cry out to God and uh, so let's just join in that cry yeah. right now. Come on. And Kyle, why don't you begin us as we pray? Yeah, Lord, would you even now, uh, Lord, spark in the hearts of some, Lord, a desire to pray and to bring others into that prayer with them, God. And I, I pray that churches in cities all over America specifically, Lord, would mm-hmm. lean in and pray, Lord, unite their cry. God, would you help us to cry for the same things, Lord, mm-hmm. to see righteousness and holiness, God, to see, uh, Lord, people far from God come near uh, to Christ and lives to be changed, God. So we we need you. We just say, Lord, there mm-hmm. is there is a tendency in us to isolate, mm-hmm. and what we need now is unity. That's right. So Spirit of the living God, bring the bride together. Bring the bride together to pray for you, mm-hmm. for you to do what only you can, to get the bride in right alignment with the head, mm-hmm. who is Jesus Christ. So Jesus, hear our cry. And Father, we know that across the landscape, we've got a lot of different denominations, different tribes, different beliefs. Mm-hmm. Uh, but Father, in, in almost all of those, there are people who know and love you. Yeah. And, and have been genuinely saved, and they believe your word. Mm-hmm. And I pray, Father, as we join together to pray with other believers in our city, uh, that we would learn to just prioritize our differences yeah. and, and, and lay the things aside that we don't need to argue about right now. But the one thing we mm-hmm. need to do is to unite in one cry yeah. to you. So I pray, Father, that your spirit would orchestrate these. And Lord, mm-hmm. I pray for those who are listening today that you'd give them courage uh, if you prompt their heart to go to another pastor or to their own pastor or mm-hmm. as a pastor to go to several friends and say, hey, let's get together and pray, even if it's over lunch, even if it's uh, just our churches, two churches coming together, we would unite our hearts because there's something irresistible to you about the cry of your children. Yeah. Lord, thank you that you love us. We love our kids so much, and we hear their cry. Mm. And Lord, how could we believe that you would love us any less yeah. than that? And so, Lord, send the revival and the awakening that we need. We pray together in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you so much once again for joining us on One Cry. And uh, if you're watching on YouTube, Uh, We ask you to like and comment and subscribe to this so you won't miss an episode. They come out every Tuesday. Or if you're listening to an audio podcast, you can subscribe on iTunes or any platform you use. And don't miss going to our website, uh, onecry.com, because there's a whole host of things that are there that would be a help to you. This book that we referenced today, One Cry, Mm. is uh, there on the website. You can get it there. And most importantly, uh, be fervent in giving to God a united cry. God bless you. We'll see you next time.